No helicopters have been procured for me to go to golf course. Thank you. I've never said he wasn't a great politician. I'm just saying he's a politician. Who's listening to you? I, <laughs> how'd you play out there today? Uh, well, I found the conditions challenging. Mostly because there's no grass on the golf course. But there never has been. I'm thinking about the swag bag, and I have high hopes for the swag bag. When you got three crevices on the green, your course is trash. What is happening, folks? Welcome back to the Beltway Golfer Podcast. This is episode 67. I am your host, Alex Dixon. On today's show, we are joined by a longtime member and leader in the Washington, D.C. golf community, Mr. Jimmy Garvin. Jimmy worked for many years at the D.C. golf courses, starting on the maintenance crew at Rock Creek Park way back in the early 1980s, working his way up to being manager at Langston and eventually president of golf course specialists, who were the longtime operator of the three D.C. courses. During his tenure, he started and led programs that opened the door to the world of golf to hundreds of kids that otherwise likely would not have been introduced to the game. And during that time, also started a traveling youth golf program called Jimmy Garvin's All-Stars, where for many years he enabled young African-American golfers to compete against their peers in destinations like the Bahamas and St. Lucia. Two players that took part in that program that Jimmy and I talk about are Marcus Bird, who is a uh, who's in the field this week at the Wells Fargo Championship, and Earl Cooper, who's a PGA professional and the and the co-founder of Eastside Golf, whose story right now can be seen on Hulu. They've got a series on the success of Eastside Golf. These programs, led by Jimmy Garvin, came to a, an unfortunate and abrupt halt in 2012 after a very public case involving a Washington DC council member who was found guilty of misusing grant money and funds that were intended for these programs at Langston. That council member ended up spending three years in federal prison and Jimmy lost his position at golf course specialists. Jimmy went on to be a part of a group that purchased Marlton golf club in Prince George's County uh, and for a time was one of the only African-American owned golf courses in the country while it was open. And today, Jimmy is back where he got his start in D.C. golf as manager at Rock Creek Park Golf Course, which is where we sat down for this episode's conversation. Before we get to that, a couple items. One, got a new sponsor I'm, I'm happy to announce, Union Green. Union Green is a golf ball and apparel brand that is all about two things that we love here at Beltway Golfer playing public golf and playing local golf. Particularly excited to partner with Union Green because the way they've gone to market really aligns with what this podcast is all about. You know, we're, we're a regional show. We stress local golf. We love and prioritize public golf. This is what Union Green is all about. They offer a pair of high-quality golf balls for the community of golfers that don't necessarily need to be dropping 45 or 50 bucks on a box of golf balls that's fit for tour pros. Union Green is a direct-to-consumer golf brand offering affordable performance golf balls that support local golfers, especially at all the munis and public courses where so many of us first fall in love with the game. Their two golf balls are the T-Bird, which is a two-piece ball designed to maximize distance, 20 bucks for 12 golf balls, and the Pin Drop, which is a dual-core three-piece ball that offers more of a balanced performance distance with greenside spin, 28 bucks for a dozen. Pretty good deal. And you go over to uniongreen.com right now. The T-Bird is at a buy three dozen, get a dozen free until May 8th. And the pin drop has a series of, of discounted sales. The more you buy, the more discount. Two dozen, get 10% off. Three dozen, 15% off. Four dozen, 25% off your golf balls. So go check it out. Go to uniongreen.com and give them a try. Last thing to bring up, we are getting closer and closer to our event. At Brenton Woods, the bankroll on June 7th, 1 p.m. It's a Wednesday. Shotgun start. We're going to do two-person better ball. We'd love to have you. If you're listening to this podcast, um, if you've never played Brenton Woods, if you have played Brenton Woods and you want to get out there again, it's a private course, country club, Montgomery County, up on River Road. Or if you just want to come 
um, and get a, get an opportunity to play with a bunch of, of fellow golfers and fellow golf enthusiasts in the Beltway Golf community, come on out. It's going to be a good time. Go to BeltwayGolfer.com. Click on Outings. All the details are there. But it's Wednesday, June 7th at 1 p.m. It's called the Bankroll at Bretton Woods. Sponsoring that event is Aslan Beer Company. If you're a beer lover in the D.C. area, you're likely very familiar with Aslan. They haven't been around super long, but they've made a huge impact on the local beer community since they have been. A-S-L-I-N, aslanbeer.com. They've got locations in Herndon, Alexandria, and on 14th Street in D.C., uh, primarily known for their IPAs, but they've got all kinds of good beer. Uh, this Saturday, coming up May 6th, they're having a... Um, they're calling it the Fruling Fest at their Alexandria location where they're going to showcase a ton of springtime loggers, which might be ideal for what we're going to have out for the bankroll. So we're excited to have Aslan as a sponsor. They're going to be providing beers for the event. So that maybe that's a, a little extra motivation to come join us at Bretton Woods on Wednesday, June 7th. That's it. Let's get to the podcast. It's Jimmy Garvin, episode 67. Enjoy. We're out here at uh, Rock Creek Park Golf Course with James Jimmy Garvin. How there are you, you sir? Go. I'm good. You go back a long way with these Washington, D.C. golf courses. We've got a book here, The Legacy of a Common Man, which we'll talk a lot, a lot about, but I, I read before this. But in the book, you talk about when you first came to Washington, D.C. and first came to work here at Rock Creek yeah. Park. What year was that? Yeah, yeah I, I was thinking about this leading up to our interview, and, and I, I got it time to somewhere between... 1979 and 1980, Okay. Um, when I came to Rock Creek, I was working for the Marriott Corporation over at Children's Hospital. And um, my love for golf began uh, playing baseball at Howard. Um, my baseball coach, uh, Chuck Hinton, who was an avid golfer, uh, he was also the last 300 hitter for the Senators. Uh, he, was, he was a great, great person. Really? Uh, last uh, 300 hitter for the Washington Senators? For the Washington Senators, yeah. Okay. And so... We were on a trip to Clemson University, and uh, he would get up every morning, and he'd be gone. I'm like, I wonder where, where the coach is. Yeah. And so when he met us at the ballpark at about 2 for the game, I'm like, Coach, where you been? He said, I've, I've been at the golf course. I said, well, tomorrow, can I go? Yeah. He said, yeah, you can go, but you got to learn to play golf. And so I picked up a golf club at Clemson University. I guess it was 1977. Uh, shagging balls for him, and from that point on, the golf bug bit me. Because the the baseball team was traveling to Clemson or playing at Clemson or something. Yes. Okay. Yes, we would travel um, uh, during our southern spring break. We would play North Carolina State, Clemson, University of Miami, um, Georgia, University of Georgia, Georgia Tech, um, all the big schools we would play. So this is already getting off topic, but because you played baseball at Howard, yeah. when did Griffith Stadium get knocked down? I'm not for certain. It was prior to it me was, coming to It was to prior. Howard. Okay. Yeah. That's what, that's what yeah. I was curious. Because Griffith Stadium was right where Howard University Hospital is now. That's correct. Right. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. But so the baseball where you guys played baseball in college was on campus there? Yeah, we played at Banneker. Okay. Um, we yeah. didn't have a home field per se, so we played at Banneker. And we would actually practice up on 16th and Kennedy okay. uh, for a while. So we never actually acquired a field while I was doing my time at Howard. We always practice and play at Banneker. So the coach got you into golf. Got me into golf, and I picked up clubs at Clemson. And from that point on, um, I was intrigued by the game. So each opportunity I had to go out to play with him, I would go. I mean, terrible at that point in time. I, you know, I would slice the ball and not know where it was going. But mm -hmm. you know, he kind of guided me through the process and. And once I started working at Rock Creek, it gave me some gave me an opportunity to come out and, and learn the game and play a little bit, you know, chipping and putting and that kind of stuff. So um, golf has been uh, probably the most influencing sport of my lifetime as it relates to what it did for me and my family. So when you started at Rock Creek, you were just working on the maintenance team? Yeah, I was learning the outside of the business, uh, mowing greens, mowing fairways, uh, manicuring rough. Um, you know, breaking bunkers and that kind of stuff, and learning a little bit about the agronomy side of it mm -hmm. uh, from um, diseases, if you will, you know, brown patch, dollar spot, fairy ring, that kind of stuff, and, and knowing how to, to uh, 
uh, detect it when it when it arises so that we could actually treat it. What did Rock Creek look like in the early 80s? It, it, believe it or not, similar. Uh, yeah. there, was, there was much more of a population that played at Rock Creek during that time. I mean, okay. it would be full in the morning, mornings when we get in, starting at about six o'clock. And Rock Creek, believe it or not, was probably one of the out, probably one of the best performing golf courses in the portfolio at that time. Uh, of the three courses, Rock Creek, Blankston, and East Potomac. Yeah. Um, so a lot of your uh, history and journey involves Blankston Golf Course. But be before we get to Langston, could you talk a lot about it in, in your book? Can you talk a little bit about just kind of your, your upbringing and, and, yeah. and, and prior to Howard? Yeah. Where are you from? And prior to Howard, I was, um, um, as, as I stated in the book, I grew up in poverty. Um, you know, two-room shack, no running water, no indoor toilet, no place to take a bath, that kind of stuff. And my mom, who I love so dearly, was an alcoholic. And she was primarily not there most of the time during my early years. My dad was. And so uh, me and my four sisters, I have two younger sisters and two older sisters okay. uh, who lived in that uh, in the house. And um, I was very, very adamant about finding a way to, to try to leave that situation, if you will. And so I created a program for myself where I played every sport, baseball, basketball, and football, mm -hmm. mastered the three. I was also a musician. I played in a band. Okay. So, what did um, you play? Um, percussions. Okay. And so I was, I was really, really working hard. And I guess I was motivated by the sense that there was no way out for me other than trying to find a way out for myself. Um, you know, I would work in the fields, picking cucumbers, tomatoes, bell peppers, that kind of stuff, uh, during the summer months when I was off to try to help my dad, mm -hmm. um, you know, feed our family. Yeah. So it was not the prettiest times in my life, but it gave me so much to, to, to think about as it relates to becoming a young man and how I wanted to live my life if by chance I was successful getting out of there. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of my, my early years in Howard. Now, the way I got to Howard was um, there was a traveling scout on the academic side that was coming through the state looking for academic superior, you know, people mm -hmm. uh, to attend Howard. But somehow he ran across my uh, accomplishments, if you will. Uh, at that time, I was I was a pitcher, baseball. Um, I was throwing at about 91, 92 miles per hour fastball. Okay. Um, had a good breaking ball. Um, scouted by Cincinnati in high school. Uh, everybody in the town and around the town thought for sure I was going to be drafted by Cincinnati um, my senior year, but it didn't happen. So when Chuck called and offered me a scholarship to Howard, I mean, he and I talked on the phone probably about two months mm -hmm. about trying to get me to leave small town of Markley and come to the big city, you know, Washington, D.C. And I'm like, well, no, I man, I, I can't come over there because, you know, as a kid, you hear so much stuff about what's going on around mm -hmm. the town of D.C. and all of the murders and all the other stuff. And I had never left the state of Florida, to be honest. Uh, so it was, it, was, it was an undertaking for me to, to make a decision to come to Howard. But once I got to Howard, and he would call, and uh, we would discuss. And, and the last thing that I remember prior to deciding to come to Howard was I, I talked to my high school principal. And one of the reasons I wouldn't accept it, the opportunity was because I said, well, can I bring some of my friends with me? You know, uh, he said, no, man, this scholarship is solely for you. And so you, you wanted to bring your whole, yeah, your hey, whole, man, your whole squad. If, I, if I'm coming to Howard, then I, if I'm coming to DC, I got to bring somebody with me. You know, I can't come by myself. Right. So he said, well, the, my high school principal, Mr. Wallace Woodruff, never forget him. He called me into his office. He said, I want to ask you a question. I said, what is uh, Mr. Wallace? Mr. Woodruff, he said, you know, if I offer you a million dollars right now, would you take it if I tell you none of your friends could have it, any of it? I said, yes. He says the same thing. He said, your family is not in position to pay for your education. Here you have a free ride. Mm -hmm. You know, all you have to do is show up. Mm -hmm. and everything else is taken care of. I think you should take that opportunity. And so I went back and I talked to my godmother who I was living with, uh, Florence Jelst. Now, Ms. Jels was very instrumental because she was the guidance counselor at my school, at the high school. Yep. And um, my dad died when I was 14. Okay. And she came and found me in the school and said, you know, I need to take you home. 
And I said, what happened? She said, well, you, your father just passed. So she takes me home, and when she let me out the car, she said, if you ever need anything, let me know. So certainly, uh, I was in need at that point in time because my mom was, was not there, and my dad had passed, and now it's just me and my sisters that are there. And so she decided that she would move me in with her uh, because she saw the potential that I had in mm -hmm. terms of, uh, one, trying to survive this situation, and two, yeah. knowing that there was an opportunity for me to do something greater with my life. And she wanted to see that come to fruition, and she moved me in with her. Did your sisters move in as well? No, just me. Okay. And so when I moved in with her, um, she made sure I had all the things that were necessary for me to survive. You know, three meals a day, clean clothes, um, my own room to sleep in and that kind of stuff. And so I started to really, really turn on the jets at that point in time and, and start to matriculate through life uh, with her support. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's heck of a heck of a story. I'm glad, mm -hmm. glad you took the scholarship offer. Yeah, man. The DC DC got you after that. Mm -hmm. And so you, once you came to Howard, you started working. Uh, you said you mentioned earlier you were working for the Marriott Corporation yeah. for a little while. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, in the book, you mentioned Mar Marriott brought you away from DC for a little bit, but but basically you've been in DC ever since. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've been in DC since 1974. Um, I got to Marriott through. Um, the trainer here, another Howard story, the, the uh, baseball trainer's son, uh, Kevin, was living on 7th and Webster Street. Once I left Howard in 1978, I didn't leave with a degree and I needed to find a way to, to get a job um, to help pay for my, for my college. Mm -hmm. And so Jake Felton, Jake said to me, you know, Jimmy, if you need a place to stay, go find Kevin, my son, and tell him I said to allow you to move into the house with him. Uh, so he was living there with uh, his cousin, uh, Sam Day, and there's just the three of us in that house on 7th and Webster Street. And I said, well, Jake, I, I'm not in position to pay any money. He said, don't worry about it, just go tell him to, I said, to, to let you move in with him. So, so I've had a lot of uh, good angels in my life that, that were there for me when I felt that there was no way out. Someone would always step in and say, hey, I got you. So that was, that was another Howard story in terms of, of, of Jake uh, being that person to allow me to move in with his son mm -hmm. in the house that they own on Webster Street. So, so bring it back to the golf. So we talked about you, you, so you got your start here at Rock Creek working, working on the maintenance and, and kind of learning, yeah. uh, learning the grounds and some of the specifics and, and what it takes to, to, to maintain a golf course. Um, mm -hmm. How did you end up moving over to Langston? Well, um, Dick Giesemann, who's the superintendent here at uh, Rock Creek. Well, actually, Dick was the general superintendent who uh, actually managed all three of the golf courses for golf course specialists at the time. Okay. And um, quick story: when I left D.C. to move to Florida for Marriott, Dick's last words to me was, "If you get down there and you need to come back, I'll hook a trail up to my truck and I come get you and bring you back." Okay. So Dick was another angel that was in my life. Uh, so once I returned back to D.C., um, I worked here for about two months, mm -hmm. uh, along with, uh, during the time we had a bad storm to come through Rock Creek and, and, and knock down a lot of trees and whatnot. So I was working with um, Bob Brock. Bob was one of the principal owners of, of Golf Course Specialists at right. the time. He and I were back cutting trees. And so for those not to interrupt, but Golf Course Specialists was the organization that had, they were the leaseholders of these three golf courses for a long, long time. 20, 25, 30 years. Prior, prior to National Links Trust. That's correct. So they were 20, 25 years. Yeah. So it was even longer than that? Cause I mean. Probably. It, yeah, I know I joined, I joined them in 19, um, about 85, 86, somewhere in there. Yeah. And so Bob Brock, was he the, the head he's guy? He was the president of the golf course specialist at the okay. time. Yeah. Got it. And uh, so he and I were out, you know, cutting trees and whatnot on, on, old, on old 17. And we developed somewhat of a friendship, but we forgot we knew each other at some point in time. Okay. So um, when I got back to D.C. to work for Dick, Dick brought me back here. I said, Dick, I need a job. I called him from Tallahassee. He said, well, Jimmy, I can't pay you what, what you're making now, but I can give you the highest paying job that we have to offer at Rock Creek. I think at that point in time, it was about 13 bucks an hour, something like that. So he gave me that job, and I worked here for about three weeks, and then he said, I need to move you to Langston to assist Marty 
Clark, who was the, the uh, site superintendent at Langston during the time. So I moved over to work with Marty uh, at Langston yeah. uh, after that. And during my time at Langston, I uh, met a gentleman by the name of Tex Guillory. Uh, Tex was an avid golfer. He was from Texas. And he knew Bob Rock. But I didn't know Bob uh, uh, until we met here. Mm -hmm. And Tex asked, asked me, he said, well, Jimmy, have you asked Bob from one of the managerial positions that they have at the golf course. I said, well, no, Tex, I haven't because I don't know Bob. Yeah. And Tex said, I know him. He said, I'll go talk to Bob and um, get Bob to get you an interview. Surely he did. I didn't think he was going to do it, but Tex went and talked to Bob, and two weeks later, Bob called me down to East for an interview. Mm -hmm. uh, once I got down to East, and, and I talked to he and, he and Frank Stevens, and, and Bob said to me at that point in time, well, Jimmy, we don't have a job that's open now as it relates to managing the properties. He said, but we might have something coming up in the near future that was prior to them building the 100 stall driving range that they have at East Potomac now. Okay. And he said, you know, next year we'll consider you for that position. Well. I'm thinking East Potomac. East Potomac, Okay, that's correct. <coughs> so two weeks goes by and um, I get a call, Bob Brock needs to see you at East Potomac. I'm like, well, hell have I done you know all I'm doing is everything that the, the site super is asking me to do mm -hmm. and uh, so I get down to see him he said well Jimmy in this business things change fast he said I need you to go back to Langston and tell the young lady who there now mm -hmm. to give you the keys because at this point in time this very moment you are now the new general manager at Langston Golf Course because someone got fired? Yes. So, I mean, that happened really fast. And, and because I had the managerial experience and the people experience and um, all the things I had um, managed to acquire from Marriott. Yeah. And this is by at what, at what point? The mid 80s? Mid, uh, let's say mid, mid to late 80s. Okay. Early 90s. 90, 1990, 1991 time frame. Okay. In there. And so I, I assumed the, the managerial position at Langston at, at that point in time. I'm thinking about it. Golf course specialists, did they take over the lease? Um, so, I mean, Langston, like Lee Elder and his family, him and Rose, they, they were running Langston, but just Langston, right? Not, yeah. the, not all three, yeah. just the I one. Think, I think Lee ran Langston for about a year. That's it. Yeah. And then there was another group prior to Lee that was running Langston. Um, and I don't, I don't know how many years they, they lasted over there, Got but... So but somewhere Langston, somewhere in there in the 80s is yeah. when... So Langston had been through a couple of changes prior to GCS coming in. And the story that I got was um, Bob and his group wanted East Potomac and Rock Creek, but they would not allow them to have the two courses without them also taking Langston. They'd be in oh, the so they originally service. they didn't even want Langston? Yeah. Yeah, so. What did Langston, when you took over as uh, as GM of Langston, mm -hmm. what, did, what was described Langston in 1991? Langston uh, was was Langston. It, it was it was a golf course where uh, a lot of people would frequent. Uh, it was during the time when there was a lot of crime up in the Langston Terrace area, and we were um, fighting to survive as it relates to the golf course, if you will. Uh, from the kids coming on, breaking into the clubhouse, to the kids stealing the golf carts, taking them up on in Langston Terrace, and, and just just it was just a bad scene mm. uh, when I got there. Um, Did that impact uh, the amount of people were playing the course? Not they necessarily. Were, they were like concerned with crime. Not necessarily, because you had that core group who was going to play Langston anyway. Okay. Um, Langston sits on the main thoroughfare, so it's easy to get on and get off. You know, was it still, because that's before the time I started ever playing Langston, was kind of the, like, most people when they think Langston now, especially like the clubhouse, it, it's really part of the community and, and, and there's guys kind of hanging out there, having yeah. breakfast, having lunch, even if they're not yeah. playing golf. Was it always like that? Even in, Always yeah, like that. Yeah. Always a home away from home for a lot of guys. And um, it just, it's, it's, just, it's just a homely feeling place, you mm -hmm. know. You're always welcome there. And especially the community, you got the four schools that were there, uh, Langston, I mean, um, Spangarn, Charles Young, Phelps, and Brown. You know, the kids would always come over for breakfast in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point in time, when I got there, um, we were concerned about the kids 
as it relates to the nutrition at prior to school. So the young lady who worked for me uh, in the F&B area, uh, Janice and I decided that, you know, we're gonna make sure those kids get some breakfast. Yeah. And uh, most of the time they didn't have any money, but we trusted them to come back to pay us. But we, the main thing we knew, we, they need to have something neat if they were gonna learn. Mm -hmm. They need to have something neat uh, probably going to school. So um, Langston, I became very fond of Langston and the community. Uh, and around and it, was, it was that kind of the, the beginnings of what became the Langston Learning Center? Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. That was, that was a time that uh, Dr. Banks, Dr. Marsha Banks and I went to the Park Service because um, he was the professor at Howard University. Um, and he was, I became friends during my tenure at Howard. And he was an avid golfer. And he and I met um, at Howard and then he followed me to Langston. Uh, kind of helped shepherd me through the process, if you will. And so, doing his research, he found that, you know, that the uh, kids in that community, or African American kids in general, um, lose a half grade point per summer mm -hmm. because they didn't have the, the technology in which they needed to apply themselves yeah. um, during that time. So, we felt a smart thing to do was to create a learning center, K through 12, welfare to work for the parents, you know, if a, if a parent wanted to come into the learning center to, to research how to buy a house, a home, if you will, uh, they could do that. Mm -hmm. But we, we knew that we had to do something to make a difference, one, to uh, divert the crime, mm -hmm. involve the kids, right? So now instead of breaking in, they're actually welcome to come in. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the carrots was that if you give me an hour in this learning center, I give you two hours on the golf course. Got it. So that's kind of how we... Uh, broke that string of, of, of ugliness, if you will, with the kids coming down. And, and I imagine most of these kids that you got into the learning center, uh, or, or a good percentage of them hadn't played golf or touched a golf club? That's correct. Yeah, yeah. golf in that community was, was not something that was uh, thought about simply because of the cost of it. Mm -hmm. and, and my thought was, you know, lack of an opportunity because you can't afford it. That was just not something that I wanted to live with because I understood um, the process, if you will, as it relates to how folks stood in the gap for me. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do everything that I could to make sure that those kids that I come in contact with have similar opportunities that I had. Yeah. Even though I came from poverty, I was able to survive and I can show them that here I am. Sure. You know, so that's, that's kind of how I saw it. So the, the, the Langston Learning Center, would, <clears throat> for folks that have been to the, the Langston Clubhouse, was this literally just kind of uh, set up in that auxiliary room when you're looking at the clubhouse, that room off to the right that's, that's got correct. yellow paint on it and everything? Yeah, that's correct. We um, had a lot of help putting that together. Um, uh, William C. Smith, who was actually one of the property owners up in Langston Terrace, mm -hmm. uh, they came down and actually built it out for us. Um, there's a group out of California. Um, I can't think of their names. You know, I'm getting old now, Alex. <laughs> um, but they came down and they actually gave us tutorials and instruction as it relates to how to put the other plans, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, to run it. And they were our partners. And so we had um, interns from Howard to come up to stand in the gap as it relates to running the center for us, mm -hmm. along with some professionals out of the community. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we'd have folks come in to talk to our kids about public safety, you know, food and nutrition, uh, hygiene, um, how to dress, that kind of stuff. So we had uh, folks that were willing to help because they know they saw the need yeah. and they knew that we were doing something that was positive to try to help change the culture around uh, what those kids were accustomed to. So. There was one gentleman I had on who was, who was in one of your programs um, for folks that have listened to, a gentleman named Marcus Bird, who's playing on the APGA Tour. He got to play in the, he had, he had a couple starts on the PGA Tour this yes. year, I think it's the Honda Classic and yes. the, uh, the Genesis Open at Riviera. Yeah. But I interviewed him on the National Extra Trust podcast and he talked about this time quite a bit. Yeah. But was he part of that, the, the, this learning center because he was part of yes. the community? Because there's also this, you started the Jimmy Garvin All-Stars. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, what, what, did it, that come later? That, that came after we, we started the learning center. Okay. Um, the way the Jimmy Garvin 
um, All Stars came about was uh, I had a visit from a gentleman from the Bahamas. Okay. Bahamas. His name is Randy Clare. He's deceased now. He came to me and said, well, Jimmy, years ago we used to have a group that would travel to the Bahamas and compete, but there was all adults. And I said to him, I said, Randy, I would love to do this, but we have to involve kids. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to do it if you don't involve kids, because my love is for the kids, right? Because of my struggle, I want to expose these kids to everything that I had not been exposed to, right? Mm -hmm. um, traveling out of the country. Uh, seeing different cultures, uh, interacting with different people from different cultures, and finding out just how how other folks live, if you will, because if you never move within with, without, within the four walls in which you are confined to, you don't know what's happening outside of them. Mm -hmm. And most of those kids had never done anything like that before. Yeah. And we wanted to make sure that they got the experience of, of traveling because if you remember when I left home from Florida, I had never left Florida before, mm -hmm. right? So I didn't know what to expect yeah. once I got to the big city of Washington, D.C. And it also gave them an opportunity to learn how to build and craft relationships because relationships, to me, are the most important things that you can have in life. Mm -hmm. um, to me, I think they're, they're, they're more meaningful to me than money. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the, the Langston Learning Center sounds like you had a tremendous impact, but you're mostly drawing from kids literally with, within the immediate surrounding community. DMV. Not, All over. Not, oh, really? Not, okay. DMV. We had some kids from Virginia. Had okay. some kids from Maryland. Oh, so it wasn't literally um, just the neighborhood? No, okay. no, no, no. No, but the, the idea was if I could get the, the high learners involved with the kids who were struggling, mm -hmm. that's a win for me because now they're going to learn from, from one another. How would somebody that's like in Virginia even, even know about it? Through the parents, okay. um, through, you know, Langston, just the, the community itself. Okay. You know, once the learners came on board, um, it was important for those kids to understand they had the place to go. Yeah. Right? And so then you develop this, uh, these Jimmy Garvin All-Stars with these basic kids that were showing some a uh, certain skill set and some yeah. promise on the golf course and then you well, kind of brought these kids to do some of these traveling tournaments yeah, like in the Bahamas and St. Lucia? It's a combination of, 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 of uh, GPA, right, mm -hmm. grade point average, um, golf skills, community service, right, and the, the willingness to, to be a part of something that, that's going to require you to be Mr. and Mrs. Mm -hmm. Yes sir, yes ma'am. Yeah. You know, um, how how you approach an individual, how you dress. So it, it was a combination of all that. How many kids, well, let me ask two questions. One, how, how long did this go for? How, like how, oh, how man, many? Um, we, we traveled to the Bahamas for about 12 years. Oh, wow. And we, we ventured to St. Lucia um, about three years. Okay. And then we had national trips where we went to Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we did a six-year stint down in Naples, Florida at the Ritz-Carlton where we would go down and um, we would invite kids from my little small town of Mockley. We'd take 20 kids from Mockley, 20 kids from Naples, and we'd bring our contingent from, from the D.C. area and we would all stay at the Ritz for the weekend. Oh, man. And uh, they would play at Tiburon, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, and so we would have uh, Florida Gulf Coast, which is in Fort Myers, to come over to add the educational side of it. They yeah. would come over and talk about college prep. Yeah. So each stop that we made, we always involved the college or university to always talk to our kids about what it means to, how do you prepare for, mm -hmm. and how do you enroll in yeah. a college or university. Going for that long, um, like how many kids at any time were in the program? Are we talking like 10, 20 kids or? Uh, we, we had, in our total program, uh, Kids that have been successful that came through, we have about 60 kids that are out there now oh, wow. that are either in the professional ram or like Marcus playing on the tour or mm -hmm. Michael Thomas who's now playing um, on the LPGA tour, okay. a young female. Um, host so there must have, but throughout the life of it. About 600 kids to be, 600 very, kids. To be wow. very honest that came through that process. There was another gentleman that we mentioned before we started ta taping that I mentioned. Because in, in the back of your book, on the on the kind of the back yeah. couple pages, 
you list a, 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 a lot of the, the kids all that came all through. All the All-Stars, right? Is that, is that all the All-Stars yeah, there? Yeah. But one, but there's, so there's a couple, I'm, I, obviously I recognize Marcus Bird, but another name jumped out uh, because he's doing really well for himself now, Earl right. Cooper, yeah. who played at Morehouse, who's a PGA professional up at Wilmington Country Club, yes. maybe? Yes, yep. Uh, but he also is the co-founder of this uh, uh, golf brand, Eastside Golf. He is doing really well. I'm so proud of him. Uh, as I am of, of all the kids that have actually come through that we've had a chance to touch. Uh, Earl was great. He and his father would come down and travel uh, with us on our trips to the Bahamas and St. Lucia and even some of the national trips. Um, they were very, very great and very supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, Earl was a great golfer. He was a great human being, uh, number one. Uh, and so we had a lot of fun. Um, and the kids, uh, uh, they kind of understood that I was there trying to support them mm -hmm. and not get in their way of success. I never told them what they had to do. Uh, there was always options for them. Mm -hmm. So they, they understood that Mr. Jimmy was here to support us and he's not in any way trying to deter. If you tell me you want to become an airline pilot, that's fine. Mm -hmm. And I said to him prior to get into the, to, the, to the program, you know, I don't expect everyone to become a professional golfer, Yeah. right? But I expect you to become a perfect human being if something is possible, sure. if that's possible. And going to have a life and a career uh, on the business side, you know. Um, you don't have to become a professional golf. I just want you to understand that there are more ways to be successful than playing golf, but golf is going to be the carrot, mm -hmm. in which gives you, you know, all the instructions of how to become that person. Well, you obviously had a tremendous impact on at least the, the, the two gentlemen I had exchanges with, Marcus. Mm -hmm. Well, Mar Marcus, did, I think it was before the Honda Classic. I saw this on social media, but somebody put a video on him and asked him who the biggest influence he had <laughs> yeah. his was in golf. And he said, Jimmy Garvin. And, and I, mean, I, don't, I don't know how much he elaborated, but he, but he, did, he talked about, certainly in my interview yeah. uh, on the National Links Trust podcast, he talked about you a lot and how those were some of the, some of the best years of his life was... was yeah kind of going after school, going to the learning center and playing golf at Langston in your program. And then Earl Cooper, I reached out to, uh, just sent a message to, and I don't have the, the, the quotes in my phone here, yeah. but he had nothing but fantastic. He responded almost immediately and, and, yeah. and said a couple paragraphs about how, how big of an impact you had and how great you were for kids and, and the impact you had in golf around here. Yeah, you know, one of, the, one of the quotes that I have that I carry with me every day is, is golf is the carrot, but education is the key, mm -hmm. right? And um, we use golf to draw minority kids to us. Mm -hmm. Now, most of our kids that come to us, parents can't afford to have those kids be involved in golf. So my thought process was, you know, our company is big enough to, to sustain um, range balls mm -hmm. for the kids. We're going to provide the educational component in the learning center, right? Yeah. And if he or she should want to go out and play nine holes of golf, that's fine. Yeah. So I think so many times we as operators, right, golf course operators, look at what's detracting from the bottom line. But if you think about it, those kids that you help now are going to be your customers in the future yeah. because they're coming back. Mm -hmm because you showed them some love. Um, you talk about it in the, in the book. Um, and, uh, we don't need to dwell on this, but we, mm -hmm. should, we should bring it up. Yeah. Um, but you talk about it very, very factually about how this uh, kind of came to an abrupt end. Mm -hmm. And it was, mm -hmm. it, was, it was a very public end. Yeah. Um, I'll let you talk about it in your own, own words, but, but just kind of, again, we don't spend a ton of time on it, but um, the, the relationship that you formed with a DC council member and how that relationship kind of led to the end of this whole program. Yeah, I, um, here again, it was, a, it was an angel, a good angel that brought this council member to me, my college baseball coach, um, brought him to me and said, hey, he wants, he wants to learn how to play golf. I'm like, okay. So we started spending time on the golf course and he knew that I was trying to find more creative ways to support the foundation in which we have with the kids. Mm -hmm. So we were out playing and he said, hey, I think I have a way that we can 
get some money to support the program. I said, okay, fine. So sure enough, uh, Dr. Banks, he and my, my partner, you know, to this day, uh, even though he's deceased, I love him to death, he said, uh, Jimmy, I'll support that. We get into the throes of it, and we ended up getting about $400,000 that was slated for swing sports. The conversation that we had prior to swing sports, so that was a separate organization, or no, 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 that, that was that was that's what the uh, the money was for swing sports. Just anything swing sports, swing meaning sports. like golf and tennis golf, and okay, tennis, I got you. Softball, just, that's the term they use. Swing sports. I got you. Okay. Now the instruction in which we were given, all you guys have to do is manage the golf. I have someone to manage the other sports. I see. Fine. So we get into it and things are going well and we get um, the first allotment to come in and the call came in, hey, have you received? Um, no, I have not received a check yet. Well, I'll make a call to make sure that you guys get what you need. So come in, get a call from the council person, hey, tell Dr. Banks not to do anything, but I'll tell him how to manage the process. And he did, you know. Uh, out of the whole thing, out of the 400,000, Alex, we probably received about 86 for, for golf, mm -hmm. Dr. Banks and I. And um, never used a dime that was not yeah. for the kids. Mm -hmm. Long story short, I mean, this is a long story, but I'm gonna try to keep it yeah. short. Um, I'm sitting in my office at Langston and a knock come on the door, and it's my assistant saying that the um, someone from the D.C. Attorney General office want to talk to you. I'm like, hey, what about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. He come in. He said, Hey, just want to talk to you a little bit about um, this grant um, that the council member got. And I said, Okay. He said, What do you know about it? I said, Well, I don't have any of the records. I said, Dr. Banks is the one who's managing the process. Mm -hmm. I gave him Doc's information. He went to talk to Doc. Doc gave him everything that we had because we knew that we were not doing anything illegal. Yeah. That goes on for a while. Um, I mean, when, they, when the feds come, they come. Yeah. I mean, they went through every thing that I own, you know, mm -hmm. and they even went to my uh, accountant and said, hey, we're here to get the record. He said, we'll take it. Yeah. Because there's nothing there. Yeah. Said, Jimmy, you know, this, Jimmy hadn't done anything wrong. There's but the, the, the feds had found that somebody was misusing the funds. Right. And so um, we thought we were clear of all that mess when uh, Dr. Banks and I had agreed to pay back the 86000 that we had legitimately used for the kids. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, they had agreed. I said, okay, Doc, we, we dodged this bullet. Now, I, I go back and say that um, an attorney friend of mine who was the council member's attorney at that point in time, working on some other issues, he wanted to learn to play golf as well. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, because I felt like some stuff was just not right. You know how you can feel sure. something's just not right? I yeah. said, Hey, go and talk to him and tell him I cannot be involved in anything that was, yeah, that's not right. Right. So he goes and talks to him, and when he comes back, he says, "Well, I talked to him. He said everything is fine. You don't have anything to worry about." Well, that still didn't set well with me. Mm -hmm. So I said to Doc, "I said, Doc, we need to have ask for an, an, an audit mm -hmm. of what's going on with this stuff." Yeah. And before we could get the audit of what was happening, they never gave it to us. Um, now we have the U.S. attorney that's knocking, right? So now they tell me, well, Mr. Garvin, you know, we didn't ask for this. This, this came to us, so we mm -hmm. got to do what we need to do. I said, okay, I don't have, I don't have anything to hide. Yeah. You know. So I said to them, but you have to understand, during that point in time, I was probably making more money than I've ever made in my entire life, and I probably will ever make in my entire life. Again, um, 
think about coming from picking bell peppers and cucumbers at 13 bucks a day, mm -hmm. right? To now making at this point, you're the president of, of GCF golf course of golf course specialists, yeah. right? So now I'm making in excess of two hundred thousand dollars a year with mm -hmm. bonus. Mm -hmm. So I said to them, I said, would it make sense for me to jeopardize that for? If you look at it, I would only get forty-six thousand dollars out of the eighty mm -hmm. some thousand that we got for golf. Mm -hmm. I said, does that make sense to you? Now, mind you, I have never been in trouble in my entire life yeah. doing anything. Yeah, Mr. Garvin, we know, but we just gotta, we, you know, we have to go where the, where, the, where the investigation leads. I said, that's fine. So it, it, it never got back to the um, authorities that I had actually sent an attorney out to talk to this man, right? Now, the rule of law says that if you notify an officer of the court mm -hmm. of some mm -hmm. bad behavior, then that should kind yeah. of shield you a little bit. Because I'm being proactive, I'm like, man, I can't be involved in no yeah. stuff. I got too much to lose, right? Yeah. So he comes back and said, no, everything is fine. Well, it, everything wasn't fine, you know? And so I got jacked up. Um, and, it turned out, I mean, the, the, the case is, is public. I mean, it's yeah, Googleable. No. It, was, it, was, it was, at some point, I'm sure, it was front page news on the Washington Post, because it was a DC council member yeah. was the one um, that ended up being found guilty of actually misusing these funds and, and buying himself cars and, and lavish gifts and all kind of stuff. misspending an awful and lot of money. I tell you, I tell you, though, the the uh, and he and he spent almost three years in jail. Right? Yes. Right. The thing that that kind of got me was, and I had never experienced anything like this before in my life. So I go to court, and my wife and I are coming out of court, right? And there's a a DC activist sitting at the front door waiting for us to come out. Mm -hmm. And she jumped up, here they come. You know, I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, is it this this big of a story? Mm -hmm. I go outside the door, here's Bruce Johnson, right? So Bruce is following me down the street. I'm like, what? Yeah. Bruce Johnson of CBS yeah. and newscaster, right? Yeah. I'm like, what? Bruce is saying, Mr. Garvin, were you duped? Now, my attorney is saying to me, well, Jimmy, you can't say anything, you know, just allow this to play out. But, but Bruce knew that in his spirit, he knew that I was not. Mm -hmm. That's why he asked the question, were you duped, yeah. right? And so I, I couldn't tell him, and I, and I didn't get a chance to talk to him before he passed, but uh, I wanted to give Bruce an exclusive in terms of what yeah. really went down. And, right. you know, I had never seen anything like that before in my life. Well, you talk a lot about it in your book. I yeah. certainly encourage anybody reading the book. And and you ended up because of your your, your name involved and, and and checks and this and that and so yeah. forth. Uh, you didn't do any any found found guilty almost uh, for lack of a better term almost as for being affiliated with, right. with this gentleman. It's called misprision of a felony, meaning um, having knowledge of a crime and not right. reporting it. So yeah. you got you got some 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 probation, probation. but you, yeah. but you lost your your job. Right? Lost everything. Right. You know, I lost I lost an opportunity to be um, to continue the legacy in which I had created um, with, with with golf course specialists for sure. Yeah. Um, the foundation didn't suffer. We continued to work with the kids yeah. uh, throughout that whole time, and during that time at, at during 24, that's when I decided to write write the book. I see. Uh, okay. About uh, my life, you know, cause, because. Up to that point, it was it was a story to behold, man. I mean, yeah. coming from where I came from and ending up on the top uh, at that point in time, I don't think there there was or there is. Um, and so, and the programs that you'd started and you built yeah. never really got picked up by anybody else. No. Yeah. No, we we uh, we're in the process of actually um, revamping them now. Um, uh, through our efforts, uh, we'll probably start our Legacy Foundation tournament again this year in okay. September, uh, and we'll hope to start traveling again next year with some kids. So another uh, big piece I want to talk about, you know, after that kind of chapter in your life, uh, you became at least a, a part owner of Marlton Golf Course in PG County, Marlton yeah. Golf Course, yeah. which was one of only five or six. African American owned courses Af in the country. African American yeah. owned golf courses in the country. Yeah. And so, and Marlton was, it, it, it's, it's not open anymore. No, right? no, yeah. we're actually in the process of selling that as we speak. Okay. Um, I was involved in that project with um, three other African American males 
Um, Did you open that course or that course was already open? It was there? already there. It was already there, okay. It was, all, it was a Kemper course at that point in time. Okay. And so one was a firefighter, one was a uh, lieutenant colonel, retired military, and one was a real estate guy. Mm -hmm. And I'm the only guy with the golf experience that was among the group. Yeah. But uh, for some reason they would not listen. Yeah. And we didn't, we didn't, we, we lasted for about four years, you know. Okay. Um, and uh, it's a great property. And so you guys are selling it now. Do you, do you think it'll remain a golf course? Or it's probably, probably going to be developed. Yeah, uh, the new guy that's purchasing it saying that he wants to remain, have it remain as a golf course. Okay, so good. hopefully, hopefully that'll that'll hold true. Yeah. Um, so you touched on uh, your, your your Jimmy Garvin Legacy Foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, is that a foundation that you've started since everything kind of ended? Mm, that was that was proud too. That, that was the foundation. That was the okay. foundation. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, we started that, and I think we got our, our certification. And my wife is going to kill me, but I think 2006. Okay. Uh, and it's been ongoing ever since. I mean, we were able to give scholarships to kids uh, as they leave the program, heading to college. Not a lot, mm -hmm. but something to help them. Uh, you know, five to six hundred bucks per kid, that kind of stuff. So, yeah. um, you know, we did we did what we could to make yeah. sure that they had a kind of a, a smooth transition, if you will, from from high school to college. And we stay in touch with most of them to this day. Uh, Do you think? I mean, because there are other nowadays. There, I mean, there are other programs out there. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the same or even that similar. But you, you, know, you got your first T. Um, you've got. Uh, um, Craig Kirby's organization, Golf My uh, Future, My Game, Golf, my future, yeah. my game. Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of organizations like that. Do you, do, do you still feel that today there's um, a need for something that, that similar to what you offered? I think so. Yeah. Uh, I think there's more of a need now than ever because of the wide spectrum of, of folks that are actually trying to get into the game. Um, the, the one thing that I, I always I've always been concerned about with the other organizations is that there's not enough enough emphasis on education. It's all it's just all about golf. golf. Yeah, and I've always had a hard time with that because my thought is if a kid can't read or write, he or she is going to miss out on some opportunities in life. Mm -hmm. Because I I just I'm a staunch advocate for education. Yeah, and and I just yeah I will not ever let that go mm -hmm. because I know how much it means to, to be well equipped yep. um, with, with some tools in your toolkit that no one can take away from you. Mm -hmm. right. Well, so today you're the, uh, you're the manager here at Rock Creek Park, yep. uh, as part of, part of National Links Trust. Um, is this where you want to be for a while or what, what's, what's, you know, is, is, <laughs> what's, what's, the, what's the future of, of, of Jimmy Garvin? Are, are, you, are you really going to try to focus on getting this program kind of back? I don't know. Um, yes, I love Rock Creek. Yes, this is a beautiful place, and uh, I love coming every day. Um, I am going to try to re retool my Jimmy Garvin Legacy Foundation and work with that and try to help as many kids as I can mm -hmm. uh, before I leave this earth, mm -hmm. if you will. And we're going to make it successful again. Uh, we're going to give kids opportunity to leave, the, you know, Washington D.C. and go see other countries and places and and understand what it means to travel and enjoy life and and and, and experience different cultures because mm -hmm. once a kid leaves home he or she that have not been equipped with that one tool the traveling tool then they've missed an opportunity to, to gain some some insight in life on life yeah. if you will uh, because kid, if you if you think about it freshmen in college are more likely not to succeed that freshman year prior because of the lack of, of preparation. Of preparation. Yeah. yeah. And part of that preparation is, is leaving that those four walls mm -hmm. and, and learning how to build relationships and, and, and create friendships. And uh, things are now more of, of the technical way, you know, but you got to talk to people, yeah. you know, and that's what I'm about. Well, I mean, you, you've, you've had quite an, quite an impact. I really enjoyed reading your book, and I really appreciate you, you coming on the podcast and telling your story. Um, I, you, 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 the fact is, you're, you're, 
you've had as much impact and one of the biggest figures in DC golf in the last 30, 40 years. Yeah. And, you know, me just kind of talking to different people and then really kind of hear Marcus Berg talk in depth about his experience mm -hmm. with you and your program and how much of an impact that you had on him. Uh, I knew I had to talk to you in person. Yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity. Um, and hopefully we get a chance to do it again. Absolutely. I don't have a good golf game, but I don't really care. I'm a, I'm a regular dude living in D.C., and I want to know about D.C.-centric golf stuff. If you can tell me something that I don't already know, then that is great for me. I don't want the regular stuff. I want exciting stuff. I want different stuff. I don't want stuff I can't hear elsewhere. But I want it to be about DC golf.